Diane, I notice that when I hang upside down, I look a lot like a racer head. Ah, coffee. Hmm, there's something strange about this coffee. Fellas, don't drink that coffee. You'd never guess. There was a fish in the percolator. Ah. Oh. Oh. oh, man, I can't Ugh. get the taste of fish out of my mouth. Well, at least I've got this new pot of coffee. Hopefully, this coffee can overpower the fish. I hope you all have a damn fine cup of fishless coffee that's black as midnight on a moonless night and a piece of cherry pie. Because today, we're going to Twin Peaks. Let's dive right in to episode one. This is, excuse me, a damn fine cup of coffee. Before we start, did you know that in Twin Peaks lore, a person can have multiple spirits? At least one for the waking life, and a dream spirit that can wander. Have you ever wanted to know what this is like? Well, Atlas VPN will allow you to digitally be in multiple places at one time. You might live in Estonia, where I'm sure the winters are very harsh, but you can connect to a server here in Texas and watch the same films as those of us in warmer climates are watching. With Atlas VPN, you can access way more movies online. Just connect to a server and watch as your options for movies just skyrockets. And get this, there's a Black Friday deal going on right now. So enjoy the Black Friday price cut because now, Atlas VPN Premium is just $1.70 per month with six months extra. And that's with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Protect your privacy and get the many benefits of Atlas VPN for this ridiculously low price. You can take this deal by clicking the link in the video description below. Be quick, as it is a limited time offer. I like to run a VPN all the time. Not just so that I can watch more films, but also, I think that Dale Cooper's on to me, and I don't want him to read all my romantic DMs to my girlfriend, who is now, regrettably, trapped in the Black Lodge. Is loving her such a crime? VPNs protect you from government agents like Coop, so you ought to get one now. Remember, it's just $1.70 right now with six extra months, so click the link and get your subscription before the deal ends. This episode was not directed by David Lynch, but rather by Dwayne Dunham, David Lynch's editor. Durham had also worked as an editor on the original Star Wars trilogy. This episode is actually his directorial debut. He would end up going on to direct the 90s remake of Homeward Bound, as well as a bunch of DCOMs. For those of you who don't watch Brutal Moose, DCOM is short for Disney Channel Original Movie. It's just an evil spell that freezes us. Go! But since the writers and the showrunners are kings in TV, this is still very much a work by Lynch and Frost. I want to say that I noticed how efficient this episode is on a rewatch. Every scene is jam-packed with information that expands the mystery and lays down the foundation for the rest of the show. Like the pilot, this episode takes place entirely in one day. It's the day after Cooper arrives, and now Laura's been dead for about 36 hours. Bobby, Mike, and James are all sitting in jail, waiting for questioning while more trouble brews. Cooper and Truman sit James down for an interrogation. They show him the video from the picnic and press him about his relationship with Laura. He relents, finally admitting to dating Laura, and adds that she did indeed have a coke addiction and that he tried to get her to stop. However, recently, something bad happened that pushed her back into the habit. He saw her the night she died, but she ran away from his motorcycle after telling him that they couldn't be together anymore. I find the tension in this scene interesting. Cooper knows that James isn't the killer, yet James is acting cagey. James thinks that he might be a serious target if he admits to having the other half of the heart, but he has no clue about the scope of the case. Cooper doesn't know a whole lot at this point either, but he does know that this murder isn't the result of some soured high school romance. What, what happened? I don't know. 
I think something scared her because she wouldn't see me. After the interrogation, Cooper lets him go without any charges. Big Ed swings by to pick up James, and James expresses his concerns for his safety. Mike and Bobby, they still want to kill him. This scene is the first time in the show that we hear someone mention the Bookhouse Boys. Gonna need a hand from the Bookhouse Boys. Somebody's gotta watch my back. We'll find out who they are later in this season, but for now, it's a mystery. Before leaving, Big Ed talks with Truman. Something was weird that previous night at the Roadhouse. He felt like he got roofied before the boys started beating on him. The bartender who might have spiked his drink was a French Canadian named Jacques Renault. Well, I'm pretty sure my beer was drugged. Jacques Renault was tended bar. Remember this name. He's a local villain who will factor pretty majorly into the story very soon. Another name we hear dropped right around this time is Albert Rosenfield. Agent Cooper, I've got a call for you from a Mr. Albert Rosenfeld. Sounds like long distance. An FBI agent who is coming to Twin Peaks to perform the autopsy on Laura Palmer. If you guys are watching the show for the first time, I can't wait for you to meet Albert. He's one of my favorite characters in the entire show. Cooper and Truman then head to see Josie Packard. Pete Martell offers him some coffee, and we all know that Cooper will never refuse a cup of joe. However, something is wrong with the coffee. There's a fish in the percolator. This has to be one of the most iconic moments in this first season. There was a fish in the percolator. They ask Josie about Laura. According to her, Laura was her English tutor, meeting with her twice a week, though she did notice that the last time she saw her, that last Thursday afternoon, Laura was acting strange and talking about death. Oh, Cooper picks up on the fact that Truman is seeing Josie instantly. So, Harry, how long have you been seeing her? Hawk heads to the hospital to talk to Ronette Pulaski's parents. He learns that Ronette worked at the perfume counter at Horn's department store. Could there be some sort of connection between Flesh World, Horn's department store, and Laura's murder? While he talks to them, he sees the one-armed man get off the elevator. He falls the man down the hallway and into an electric blue room. In that room, Hawk loses him, but it's implied that the one-armed man went to the morgue. What's he doing there? What's with this overpowering blue lighting? Twin Peaks as a show is rife with warm tones and scenes that are soaked in red, so this intense use of blue is actually quite jarring. Where red gives us feelings of sexuality, irrationality, anger, and passion, blue elicits more feelings of calmness, reason, and peace. It could be that the hospital, standing in stark contrast to the rest of the town, is a center for reason in Twin Peaks. Maybe that's why Hawk pursued the one-armed man. It's quite strange that he followed him, right? But if you think about it, the one-armed man is like a dream character, someone who's not totally of this world, and he's trespassing into the world of science and reason. Maybe that's why Hawk felt like he had to follow him. Their final interrogation happens at the Double R Diner over a cup of coffee and some cherry pie. We learn from Norma that Laura helped organize the Meals on Wheels program, and Truman asks for the names of the people on the route before Coop orders two more slices of cherry pie. In Cooper's honor, I will now eat a slice of cherry pie. I encourage all of you to do the same. Mm. I'm going to be so fat by the end of the series, aren't I? I wonder, does the Black Lodge have any, like, you know, weight racks or Atlas stones or God, even like a row machine or something? Okay. In the diner, Cooper and Truman see the log lady again. The log lady walks to Cooper and says that her log saw something the night that Laura died. Cooper can ask the log if he wants to know, but he doesn't. I thought so. Now, I've got a log here, and this log did indeed see something that night. Major spoiler warning for the entire show. Log, do you want to tell the audience what you saw on the night of Laura Palmer's death? Wow, that sure is something. You really saw all that? Did you guys catch all that? That sure was something. Cooper's reluctance to ask the log shows that he hasn't quite embraced the dream logic of the town. 
He gets called Sherlock Holmes in this episode, and it does seem like Holmes is a character that heavily inspired the character of Cooper, or at least Cooper early on in the series. However, with this mystery, rationality and deduction can only take him so far. It can lead him to people involved in the inciting incident, but it can't lead him to the real truth. If he's going to make headway in this case, he needs to embrace irrationality and the dream logic of Twin Peaks. What really went on between Marilyn Monroe and the Kennedys? And who really pulled the trigger on JFK? There are other stories happening at the same time in this small mountain town. Let's take a look at Bobby and Mike. We pick up where we left off with them from the pilot, in the jail cell. But it seems like legal troubles are the least of their worries. They owe Leo Johnson 10 grand. They had that 10 grand. How they got it, I don't know. But that 10 grand is long lost. Remember that wad of cash that Cooper and Truman found in Laura's safety deposit box? That's the money that they owed Leo. Laura was supposed to deliver the money in exchange for the coke, but since she passed away and now the safety deposit box is in government hands, I highly doubt that Leo will be seeing any of that money anytime soon. She was supposed to hand it over today, then oh. she went and checked out on us. So how are we supposed to get 10 grand for Leo? Now we have a better idea of who Leo is. He's a kingpin criminal of a small town. He's a trucker, so it's safe to presume that he uses his trucking business as a front to smuggle drugs and people, considering that his truck was featured in Flesh World. Furthermore, all the signs are now pointing to him being Laura's killer, as Shelley discovers his blood-stained blue shirt at the beginning of the episode. She steals it, but we don't know what she does with it yet. And boy, does she pay for this infraction. Leo goes full metal jacket on her, stuffing a bar of soap into a sock, and then beating her with it. There was an SNL sketch that aired while Twin Peaks was airing that showed Cooper trying to figure out who the killer was, all while Leo Johnson kept confessing to the crime. I guess you heard I did it. I'm ready to do my time. Get me a beer. Here's me about to kill her. Here's me killing her. Here's me wrapping her in plastic. It really does feel like Lynch and Frost are trying to tell us outright that Leo is the killer. But there's a problem with thinking that. There's no doubt that Leo had something to do with Laura's death. And it's beyond the shadow of a doubt that Leo is an evil man. However, in a murder mystery such as this, anyone who appears to be the culprit near the beginning is almost never the culprit. That's Murder Mystery Writing 101. Donna's story in this episode is mainly building on her growing relationship with James. She confesses to her mom that she has fallen in love with James and that she feels like she has betrayed Laura in doing so. In this exchange, Donna states a line that I feel perfectly encapsulates Twin Peaks. It's like I'm having the most beautiful dream and the most terrible nightmare all at once. This line reinforces a couple key elements of the show, the dreamlike nature of their world and the duality between good and evil and comedy and horror. It's a line that you can use to describe Twin Peaks to a friend who's never seen it. It's like a beautiful dream and a terrible nightmare all at once. After she talks to her mother, she visits Laura's mom. She tells Sarah that she misses Laura very much, and Sarah, in her grief, sees Laura's face superimposed onto Donna, and so she thinks that Donna is her daughter. She hugs Donna tightly, and in that embrace, sees Bob staring at her in the room. You might notice a bit of a goof here. It cuts pretty quickly, so it's easy to miss, but Bob is hiding behind a bed. Donna and Sarah are in the living room. There is no bed. Dwayne, you fucked up. <laughs> How could you? I'm adding this to the Cinemas Encounter right now. Actually, this shot is recycled from the previous episode, or rather the international cut of the previous episode. You'll see many more recycled shots in the next episode. I suppose if I were to defend it, I would say that she's seeing a vision of this man in Laura's room rather than seeing the man appear in front of her. But maybe it's just a spatial error. I don't think it's that big of a deal though, as it has never taken me out of that moment. Donna finishes up her day with dinner with her parents and James. They all seem to have a nice time and the two lovebirds are hopelessly in love with each other. It's that strong kind of teenage love or affection that adults don't have because society has slowly but surely grinded our souls to dust. While they're having dinner, Bobby and Mike see James's hog in front of the house, 
and Bobby delivers a pretty good line. Too bad we can only kill him once. I think it's safe to say that this conflict is not over. There are a couple of other stories cooking up in this episode. For one, we get a glimpse into the strange love affair between Ben and Catherine. They've been having this affair for years, it seems. I mean, I feel bad for Pete. I guess he probably knows that he's a cuckold, and so he uses his romantic energy to simp for Josie. Part of their relationship is their business. In fact, it seems like their illicit business activities fuel their passion for each other. Sweetheart, it's all the same to me. They scheme to burn down the sawmill. They want to light a fire, a big fire. Are they just talk, or will they walk the walk when it comes to fire? Ben and Catherine just hope that Pete and Josie don't discover that there are two ledgers, one doctored and one genuine. That would incriminate them. <laughs> Gee, I wonder what could happen next. Oh, one last thing about Ben Horn in this scene. He's definitely channeling Tarantino when he sucks on Catherine's toes. Ben Horn's daughter, Audrey, comes to a bit more prominence in this episode. She flirts with Cooper at the beginning and later dances to music until Ben confronts her about her actions the previous day, saying that Laura may have died two days ago, but that he lost Audrey years ago. We can see Audrey's sense of rebellion turning towards her dad. Pairing that with her infatuation with Cooper, she'll probably try to help him solve the case, as long as it paints her father in a bad light. Something fun about this scene is the use of music. When we see Audrey dancing, and I want to point out that she looks like she's in a trance when she dances. It's as if she's somewhere between dreams and reality. We think that the music is non-diegetic. Ben proves this wrong by turning off the record. It's subtly jarring and leads us to question what is part of the audience's film experience and what is part of the world of Twin Peaks? Is the music that plays actually playing in the air of the town? I have to mention Big Ed's wife, Nadine, and how she's working on her noiseless drape runners. It's a point of obsession for her and weirdly expresses her love for Ed. She's so distraught by Ed getting beaten up at the roadhouse that she has to focus all her energy onto something else. And do you know how it works? Do you know what makes it work? Cotton balls. Finally, we arrive to that final little thread of the episode, Dr. Jacoby. Turns out, he was the one who stole the necklace, and he was also in love with Laura. Laura seemed to like him as well, referring him to James, who she thought was sweet, but just too dumb. I'm no uh, medical ethics person or anything, I'm just a little YouTuber, but I think it's pretty unethical for a psychiatrist to have a romantic relationship with a high school age patient. But he's not the killer, he's just a bit of a creep. We know this, because in Laura's tapes, she talks about the man who would go on to kill her, but the audio cuts out right before she says his name. They can't spoil the mystery this early in the show, now can they? At this point, you might be wondering, why isn't Twin Peaks as weird as I thought it would be? I thought this was a David Lynch show, and this episode just feels like a police procedural mixed with a soap opera. If you're thinking this, then have no fear, because in the next episode, David Lynch returns to the director's chair, and it gets weird. I see episodes 1 and 2, or I guess are labeled as the pilot in episode 1, as set up for the show. They introduce us to the characters and world, give us all the exposition, and create the various story threads that make the show possible. Episode 2, as I see it, is where Twin Peaks becomes Twin Peaks. Before I end this episode, I want to point out a couple little things I found interesting. For one, there are two mentions of coconuts here. Truman refers to Big Ed's head as a coconut, and later on, Jacoby takes the heart necklace out of a coconut. Are Lynch and Frost creating a link between coconuts and the mind? Laura's heart was in Jacoby's coconut, and she implies that she loves him for his brain. Earlier, we see a flashback between Laura and James. Laura tells James that she's giving him the heart because I really believe that you love me. Now my heart belongs to you. Notice how she doesn't tell him that she loves him. Maybe she did, but also, maybe she didn't. She was at least attracted to James because of his heart. Laura now appears more fractured than ever. She's split between at least three men. Jacoby for his mind, James for his heart, and Bobby for the drugs. These forces were all pulling on each other, and her descent into darkness sure didn't help things. Well guys, I think that about covers it for this episode. I guess I'll see you guys next week. I've been the Kino Corner, and I will see you all in the next video.
Now that we're at the end of the video, let's just sit and appreciate the best dad in the show, Major Briggs. Rebellion in a young man your age is a necessary fact of life.